Hey guys, Mr. P. In this video, we're going to start with a discussion of the processes of life in unicellular and multicellular organisms. According to our current understanding of biology is that all living things possess these traits. Those traits being metabolism, growth, reproduction, response to stimuli, homeostasis, nutrition, excretion, and movement. Metabolism, by definition, is the sum totality of all chemical reactions that occur within a cell or the organism. That includes, as we'll talk about in a minute, catabolism and anabolism. Growth is the physical act of gaining in size or mass. Okay, That is sometimes paired with development. Again, we're going to dive into all of these in more detail. Reproduction is the ability to produce offspring. Response to stimuli is the uh, ability to change as the environment changes. Homeostasis is the maintenance of a constant internal condition. Nutrition is the ability to acquire the energy and materials needed to maintain life. This one is all about utilizing the food that an organism either produces or consumes. Excretion is the ability to release materials that are not needed for or within the cell. These materials are often harmful, but don't have to be. Movement is the ability to move or change positions. It is important to note that if the functions of life are evident, then life is said to be present. Now, uh, as we discuss what it means to be alive, there obviously is some gray area, and so we potentially have flaws in our current understanding or our current definition of life. Uh, for instance, it is very easy to assume or very easy to appreciate that a dog, for instance, is alive because a dog has its own metabolism. It can grow. It does excrete. It does move. It maintains homeostasis. It does respond to its environment. They can reproduce, and you obviously have to feed them. But when we start getting into things like viruses, which we'll talk about later in the syllabus, viruses don't possess their own in-house metabolism. They require the metabolism of the host cell. Uh, and because they don't have their own metabolism, then they therefore can't be considered alive in the context or within the context um, that has been established for this particular phenomenon. Okay, Cells, uh, unicellular, and the cells that make up multicellular organisms possess all of these properties that are present both in unicellular and multicellular organisms. So those are things to keep in mind as you work through your understanding of the processes of life in both unicellular and multicellular organisms. So if we go into a little more in depth about what all of these processes are, we start with metabolism. Metabolism, like I said, is the sum totality of all chemical reactions in a cell. Now, the chemical reactions are usually in the presence of an enzyme. So when we talk about metabolic reactions, we're talking about enzyme-catalyzed reactions. These enzyme-catalyzed reactions are going to be catabolic pathways and anabolic pathways. Catabolic pathways is the breakdown of large organic compounds, usually in the form of food, into the small cellular building blocks or monomers that are then going to be used in anabolic pathways to synthesize larger macromolecules that the cell needs to use. We're not building our cellular infrastructure on the large food items that the cells are consuming. We're consuming large molecules, we're breaking those down into individual monomers, and then we're building or synthesizing from those individual building blocks larger compounds that we can use to structure the cell. In the process of breaking these down and building up the molecules we need, we are going to release heat and we're going to produce energy. This is the energy that is utilized by the cell in order to do its cellular bioenergetics and cellular processes. We talked about it a little bit before, okay? but viruses lack their own metabolism, which is a reason they are not considered a member to the self-sustaining life and therefore are non-living. Growth, organisms possess the ability to grow, which is the ability to increase in size uh, and mass of an organism, and it's often paired with development. Development is the transformation of the organism through its lifespan. You can see in this particular image, when we look at the life cycle of a leopard frog, we see that the uh, cell starts off very small and will produce a, a variety of different intermediate body types or body stages on its way to adulthood. That frog physically gets bigger 
as the life cycle goes, and so therefore growth is evident. Now, some organisms like this frog go through a transformation process from egg to tadpole to frog, and the structures look different, and the body type looks different, okay? Development is often paired with growth. Uh, sexual maturation often is paired with growth. Uh, physical maturation is often paired with growth, but growth is just the act of physically getting bigger. Metamorphosis is the process of transformation from an immature form to an adult form in two or more distinct stages. Again, not all organisms go through a metamorphosis. A lot of insects will. If you think about moths and butterflies undergoing a metamorphosis from the egg to the caterpillar to the adult form, uh, frogs are the same thing egg to tadpole to adult form, but not all organisms go through that. Reproduction is the ability to produce viable op uh, offspring. Sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction are two forms of reproduction that are seen in living things. Sexual reproduction involves two parents and the fusion of haploid sex cells from each parent. Asexual reproduction involves only one parent and produces offspring that are genetically identical to the original parent. Um, Usually, unicellular organisms are going to go through asexual reproduction in a form of division uh, that is known as binary fission. Some multicellular organisms can go through asexual reproduction as well, like budding and fragmentation. Those are going to produce uh, exact clone copies of the parent. But humans are organisms that are going to go through sexual reproduction, which involves the, the haploid gametes that are going to fuse to produce the zygote and then ultimately produce the embryo, which will develop into a fetus. Meiosis allows for a sexual life cycle with fusion of gametes because meiosis is the process of dividing the chromosomes in half in order to produce haploid gametes, which then give the organism the ability to fuse those gametes to produce a viable diploid uh, embryo. Sexual reproduction produces offspring that are genetically unique and increases genetic variation within a species. Asexual reproduction is not going to produce any kind of or increase any kind of genetic variation within the species because it produces identical copies to the original parent. Sexual reproduction, however, produces genetic variation, which is important for the viability of the organism or for the species long term. Binary fission and mitosis are mechanisms of asexual reproduction. You can throw budding and fragmentation into that category as well. Response to stimuli is the ability of a cell or organism to produce a response to a particular external or environmental stimulus. In E. coli cells, the uptake of lactose sugar from the environment triggers the production of an enzyme necessary for the utilization of that sugar as a nutrient source. The cells are able to respond to external factors with a responsive gene expression. You don't need to understand this particular pathway yet. This is essentially called the lac operon. However, it is important to note that at this point in the IB syllabus, you know that E. coli will not produce the enzymes necessary to break down lactose sugar until lactose is present in its environment. It's a way of utilizing uh, energy conservation or conserving energy. But once lactose is identified in its environment, it's going to trigger the response from environmental factors or environmental stimuli to produce the enzymes necessary to break down the lactose. Again, that is the ability of the E. coli to respond to its environment and, and utilize that stimulus to do something internally Cells or organisms recognize stimuli in their environment by way of embedded proteins in the cell membrane. Okay, This is a, a kind of cross-section of human skin. You can see that there are hairs. The hairs are embedded into the lower layers of the epidermis, and you see that there are a variety of other receptors like pain receptors, cold receptors, which are thermoreceptors, touch receptors, which are mechanoreceptors, Heat receptors and pressure receptors are other forms of those mechanoreceptors as well. All of these receptors are going to help take stimuli that are outside of our body and do something internally in order for us to recognize different stimuli as they are presented to us. Homeostasis is the ability to maintain a constant internal condition. It is important that 
or to note that all organisms, whether they are small mammals or humans, have the ability or need the ability to maintain homeostasis. It also is important to note that there are always fluctuations in an organism's environment. And if there are temperature fluctuations, the organism needs to have a way to maintain and regulate its internal temperature. Otherwise, the organism is in jeopardy of overheating uh, or becoming too cold, and that can have dire consequences uh, in terms of the viability of the organism. Many adaptations have evolved to help organisms maintain homeostasis within, within their environment. For instance, a jackrabbit has very large ears. You see large ears in a lot of desert-dwelling organisms because there is a lot of uh, blood vessels associated with the ear. It gives the uh, desert animals large surface area to cool their blood because their blood in these blood vessels are so close to the surface of the skin that it allows for excess heat to dissipate out of their ears. Really good adaptation in, in terms of regulating body temp. Uh, dogs have the ability to pant. Uh, they pant to release extra uh, internal heat through their mouth. Homeostasis in humans, we have the ability to sweat when our body gets too uh, hot. We have the ability to shiver when our body gets too cold. We have the ability to release uh, hormones from our brain uh, or trigger the release of hormones from our brain. Those hormones are typically released from the pancreas uh, and other adrenal glands, which will help regulate different uh, body processes like blood sugar is regulated through the pancreas and the liver. We have the ability in our muscles to contract and uh, produce heat, like I said, when we shiver. So we have the ability to regulate a lot of different variables within our body all the time. The next one is nutrition. All organisms have the ability to acquire food and energy. Now, autotrophs are organisms that are producers or that produce their own food, so they use external energy sources to synthesize carbon compounds from simple organic substances. Uh, typically, the plants are going to use photosynthesis to produce their energy from sunlight. Heterotrophs, all of the consumers, are going to use carbon compounds obtained from other organisms to synthesize the carbon compounds that they require. That is in the form of consumption. So producers produce by way of photosynthesis, at least on land. Grasshoppers in this particular food chain, the frog, the snake, the hawk, are all consumers and will therefore consume either plants or other organisms in order to produce the carbon compounds they need. Excretion is a process in which metabolic waste is eliminated from an organism. Now, we have the ability to excrete a lot of different waste. Typically, we excrete waste through our kidneys uh, and urinary tract. We also have the ability to excrete carbon dioxide, which is a waste gas produced during aerobic respiration through our lungs. Plants whether you think they produce waste or not, actually do, and much of the excretion that occurs in plants is going to occur via the leaves, roots, and stems. And if you look really, really close with a microscope on the underneath side of a leaf, you see that the leaves have a variety of these little pores called stomata. Those are gonna help uh, uptake and release both the things that are needed for the photosynthetic pathway to take place and serve as a, an, an excretion point for waste gases as they produce them. At the cellular level, if we dive into an individual cell, a lot of the excretion of materials occurs at the cell membrane. There can be a variety of different protein pumps, there can be a variety of channel proteins, but the things that are produced in a cell that need to be excreted are going to be excreted through the cell membrane. Movement is a fundamental property of all living things. Adaptations for movement are universal. Uh, or are a universal feature of living organisms. Sessile organisms stay in one place, whereas motile organisms are mobile. It is important that appreciate that there are organisms that live a very sessile uh, lifestyle, and there are other organisms that live with a motile mode of uh, lifestyle. Unicellular organisms carry out all the processes of life. So we just talked about all of those processes, and now we need to talk about all of those processes within two very unique uh, unicellular organisms. These would be uh, single-celled eukaryotes. One would be more of the animal cell variety, and one would be more of the plant cell variety. 
in the paramecium, if we focus in on all of those in order to determine how and if all of those kind of life processes are uh, identified within a paramecium, we start with the fact that a paramecium is a heterotrophic eater. It eats smaller unicellular organisms for nutrition and therefore contains a lot of the dissolved enzymes within the cytoplasm of this particular cell to catalyze a lot of those biological reactions, which again I said involve biological catalysts called enzymes in order to undergo this, this process of life that is nutrition. In order to maintain homeostasis, the paramecium is going to take in excess water and then it's going to collect that excess water into a pair of contractile vacuoles here and here which take in and release water through an opening in the cell membrane. The fact that the paramecium, which is a single cell, has the ability to take in and expel water, uh, maintains its water balance or hydration level, which is a form of homeostasis. Waste products from digestion are excreted through an anal pore. Again, it has the ability to excrete waste products. The paramecium can move through its environment by beating of cilia to move in different directions in response to changes in the environment. So it has the ability to move, and it typically moves in response to changes in its environment. The paramecium will grow until it reaches a maximum surface area to volume ratio, and then it will divide again. The nucleus of the cell divides via mitosis to take another nuclei before the cell reproduces asexually. So it has not only the ability to grow, it has the ability to reproduce as well. All of these are life processes that can be seen in all living things, especially in this paramecium. If we focus in on the other organism, we will see that just like the paramecium, it has the ability to maintain homeostasis and produce all of those other life processes like uh, nutrition. This particular organism is an autotroph, unlike the heterotrophic nutrition process of the paramecium. This one has photosynthesis for nutrition, which means it is an autotroph. It is a producer. It produces its energy by way of photosynthesis. The cytoplasm and chloroplast contain dissolved enzymes, just like in the paramecium, that catalyze biological reactions, which is a form of metabolism, such as digestion, photosynthesis, cellular respiration, and the synthesis of cellular structures. The oxygen byproduct of the photosynthesis diffuses out of the cell through the cell membrane. That is a form of excretion. To maintain homeostasis, excess water within the cell is collected into a pair of contractile vacuoles just like the paramecium, which take in and release water through an opening in the cell membrane. A light-sensitive eye spot allows the organism to move to its, uh, to, through its environment using two flagella. That again is response to environment. It can seek out and position itself within areas of light. The cell will grow until it reaches a maximum surface area to volume ratio and then it divides, again, just like the paramecium. And the nucleus of the divides via mitosis to make another nuclei before the cell reproduces asexually. That is it for this particular video. This video is all about highlighting the specific processes that are unique to all living things. If you learned something, give it a thumbs up. If you have a question, you can leave them in the comments. See ya.